This morning, I am privileged to share the word with you. A couple weeks ago, Pastor Lee and I were talking about what we would preach on during this two-week gap, and Lee doesn't know this, but I named this mini-series A Stop in the Psalms. A Stop in the Psalms. Thanks, Janine, for that laugh. Appreciate that. (laughs) This morning, I am charged to share the word with you guys. I'm excited about it, and uh, let me tell you how this message came about. A couple of weeks ago, I was at Nyack College. I visit Nyack uh, once a month for a pastor's coaching, a coaching cluster. And uh, one of the, um, it, it, every month I get together with these guys, it's a time of fellowship, and then we have a guest speaker come and share with the pastors that are there. It's a group of six or seven of us, so it's a small group. And this month's guest speaker was a gentleman by the name of Christian Hernandez. He's a pastor out in Astoria, Queens, and He's, a, he's an author as well. And he brought his book uh, called Beholding and Proclaiming. It's on the art of homiletics because he posits that preaching is kind of like an art form where the pastor or the preacher begins his study, his study by opening the text and literally staring, spending time with the text until he sees Christ revealed. As he sees Christ revealed, the Holy Spirit gives him insights, and and all the pastors to do, all the preachers to do is on Sunday morning, point to the insights he's found in the text and proclaim those insights, beholding and proclaiming. I was charged to speak on Psalm chapter 8 today. As I read this psalm, I couldn't help but think that this concept, beholding and proclaiming, is exactly what David does, the psalmist David does here. He, he starts this psalm by beholding the greatness of his God and then proclaiming his findings in writing. I want to share a message with you this morning that I've entitled From the Cradle to the Stars. From the Cradle to the Stars. The bottom line this morning, if you're taking notes, is simple. It's the reality that the majesty of God's name is seen in the dignity he offers mankind. The majesty of God's name is seen in the dignity he offers to you and to me. Matt, if you would throw up Psalm chapter 8, we're going to read it together. It says this, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place, what is man that you were mindful of him? And the son of man that you would care for him? Verse five, yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. You crowned him with glory and with honor. You've given him dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we look to you this morning, you whose name is majestic, You who set the stars and the moon in the heavens, you set them in place. You have given us dominion over all the earth. And Father, we look to you this morning simply to reflect on your goodness and your grace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Psalm chapter 8 is a psalm of David. It's a psalm of joyous character. It's a sincere and passionate meditation on and admiration of the glory and the greatness of God. I can almost picture David laying down in these green pastures. He he looks up at the stars as he's laying there, and he recognizes it's God who's, who's placed them there and who keeps them in their place. He looks at the moon and the heavens and he sees the very character and the nature of God, his goodness in his creation. 
Man, isn't it a good thing to step outside of our quiet room and step outside and, and see the, the, the goodness of God in creation? Somebody once said it's a great thing to enter the inner chamber. It's a greater thing to open the door, to go out in an enjoyment of that presence which nothing can disturb. David opens and closes this psalm, verse 1 and verse 9, are a reflection on the majestic name of his God. Somebody once said this, all knowledge and worship of God has its first and last roots in the name of God. As I read this scripture, as I reflected this past week, there was one question, well, several questions, but one of the questions that came to mind this week was, what's in a name? What's in a name? Here's what I know. Names are important. It places names often identify the historical significance of that location. Philadelphia means what? City of brotherly love. Jerusalem is the city of peace. Similarly, people's names are often tied. They give insight to their identity. When a newly married woman changes her last name to match the name of her husband, she's agreeing to align herself. And the very essence of who she is, the very essence of her identity with the man that she loves. A child who's adopted assumes a new identity by taking his, his or her parents' last name as their own. Names are so powerful, so potent, that parents will often avoid attaching certain names to their to their children. For instance, we don't see kids walking around with the name Adolf Hitler or Benedict Arnold because those names represent something so negative that nobody would want to associate an innocent child with it. Names matter. Here's what, I, what else I know about names. Is that you can have a name but not have the same quality attached to that name. If, for instance, a couple months ago, a buddy of mine called me and was like, dude, I need some help at the house, some help with some electrical stuff. I was like, you got the wrong Ernesto Rivera? <laughs> That's not to say that I'm not gifted, just not gifted in that area. I'll give you my dad's phone number. <laughs> Parents have named their children Michael Jordan for years on end, hoping to somehow tap into greatness. Now it's LeBron. <laughs> Parents have named their children Bill Gates, somehow hoping to associate with this great wealth. And so sometimes the quality of, na of the name doesn't, it doesn't indicate anything, right? That my name doesn't mean that I'm a good electrician or a good craftsman, whatever the case might be. But when a name is connected to the quality it represents, the result is something powerful. That's to be said about the name of God as well. Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Peter reminds us that there's salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So we look to the majesty of God's name. God's name is so powerful, so important, that in heaven the very mention of his name evokes worship. And so David opens and closes this psalm Referencing God's name. It says, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. He uses two different words for Lord in the Hebrew. The first one is Yahweh. By calling out to Yahweh, David is affirming Israel's submission to the one true God. It's the covenant name for, for God. The second time he says Lord, he uses the word Adonai for master. It's used 449 times in the Old Testament to reflect a servant-master type relationship. It's a term used to define the one to whom the speaker, or in this case the writer, is subject. David is saying, God, you possess absolute authority personally over my life. David is a believer here who not only declares himself to be a member of the congregation, the nation of Israel, whose Lord is Yahweh, but also acknowledges this, this Lord of the congregation personally as his servant and as his worshiper. 
I think what David is saying here is not only is Israel submitted to you, God, but I lay myself down in submission to you. David is acknowledging that God as God has the right to expect his obedience, but also that as a servant of God, he'll be provided for. David refers to God's name as majestic. Mark mentioned this earlier. I promise you we didn't talk before today. God's name is synonymous with his nature. And his nature is reflected in the works of his hand and his perfections. It's indicative of his power, of his sovereignty, of his glory. As David says, in all the earth. The way I see it, God's name is like a, like a key that unlocks the treasure God has in store for us. David continues to talk through the majesty of God's name. In verse 2, he says, out of the mouth of babies and infants, you've established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. The exposition of this verse can be found in the book of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 14 to 17. Jesus enters the temple, temple and turns over the tables, and after turning the tables over, a blind man and a lame man came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Verse 15 says, but when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things he did... And the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant. They were angry. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. David is saying that children and babies sing words telling how great you are, God. I think the point here is that God is glorified by simple faith and childlike humility. You get a picture of that in David's next couple of words. God's ordained that the weakest shall confound the strong. And so David, after reflecting on the majesty of God's nature, of his character, he continues to recognize two key truths that I believe we can hold on to today might be a little confusing for a moment, but I'll, I'll try to unpack it for you. The first reality is that human beings are small. The second one is that human beings are great. Having considered the majesty of God's name, we look at what John Stott calls the littleness of human beings. Verses 3 and 4 says this. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. What is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you would care for him? Somebody said, meditation fits for humiliation. When David had been contemplating the works of creation, the splendor, the harmony, motion, influence, he lets the plumes of pride fall and begins to have a self-abating thought. David recognizes that the heavens are the works of God's fingers. I can imagine David laying there with his mind being blown as he looks up at the heavens and recognizes it was God who placed the moon and the stars and it's also God who's mindful of him and who cares for him. That word mindful has a, has a compassionate, almost purposeful tone. It, it means to remember you remember people along the way, right? And, you know, we're different. We're human. And, and as we remember people, it's easy for that thought to kind of be fleeting. It just passes through our mind. Oh, I remember this person, and that thought is gone. No, but when God remembers, the implication is that he moves towards the object of his remembrance. And so he doesn't just remember you like a fleeting thought. He starts moving towards you. And then David says that you would care for him. It means to tend to. In other words, not only does God remember David, but he moves towards and he, he, he acts on David's behalf. He's concerned for David. I think the, the simple point in this part of the psalm is the, 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 reality, the, the reality that God cares for you. That's the heart of the gospel, isn't it? God cares for you and for me. He's holy and all-powerful, yes, but he's also full of mercy and compassion. 
way I see it, he's not some neutral type being sitting on some high mountaintop in some inaccessible place. He's a God who cares for you and for me. He cares about his children. He cares about the weak. He cares for the poor. He cares for the naked. He cares for the broken, for the oppressed, for the marginalized. He cares for the hated. He takes their side. He takes our side. Not because we are deserving of it or because we're good. He takes our side simply because he's that kind of God. My question to us is, David took time to reflect on this reality. How often do we take the time to reflect on said reality? The, the truth that the God who created all things who placed the moon and the stars in the sky, the God who created the earth and everything in it is mindful of you and cares for you. If we start considering the, the, the world we live in, the, the solar system, so infinitely small in comparison with the countless galaxies, millions of light years away, it, it, it seems incredible, very unlikely that the great God of the universe should take any note of us at all, let alone care for us. But the reality is, he does. He does. And so we've considered the, the littleness of human beings in the light of the majesty of God's name. Now we look at the greatness of human beings. Verse 5 says this, you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You've given him dominion over the works of your hands and put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the path of the seas. In verse 4, David says, what is man that you were mindful of him? The Hebrew word for man there is enos, E-N-O-S, emphasizing man's mortality and weakness. I think David's trying to make a point here that man is simply a frail creature made of dust. And so one of the questions I asked myself this week is, if I am so weak, if I am so frail, why does God pay any attention to me at all? And I think the answer is found in the promise he makes humanity in the book of Genesis in the very beginning. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 27. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, and all over, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created the male and female. He created them. Verse 5 says, you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. Science says man is just a little higher than the animals, right? God says man is a little lower than the angels. The reality here this morning is that man is like the rest of the world, God's workmanship, but man is also de designed, you and I are designed to be a ruler of the world as the image of God in his glory and majesty. God himself crowned Adam and Eve. He gave them dominion over the creatures, and we are co-regents, co-regents with God. The angels are his servants, but we are his kings. One day, all who have trusted Jesus as Lord will be like him. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 says, Beloved, we're God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. So what's the issue? Because I look around, and I don't see us living as kings, but truthfully, I see us living more often than not as as slaves. Because I think, well, I know that at the fall, we lost our crowns. We forfeited our glorious dominion. And Romans 5 reminds us that at the fall, sin and death reigned. To sum it up, God made man a little lower than the angels, and he's been getting a little lower ever since. But here's the hope in Jesus. 
the second Adam, this dominion has been restored. You see, it's in him that our dominion is exhibited. Paul reminds us that all things are under his feet. This past week, I was on a teaching team call, and Pastor Lee shared something pretty interesting that I'm going to hold on to. He said, the best sermon illustrations come from the text itself. And so exposition of this part of the verse can be found in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 6 to 10. Thank you, Pastor Lee, for that. It says, it has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and with honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Verse 9. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels. Namely, who? Jesus. Crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Verse 10. It was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. I'm going to try to summarize this for you the best I can. God the Father created us to be kings. The disobedience of Adam and Eve robbed us our crowns. But Jesus came to earth and redeemed us to be kings. Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 to 6 says this, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests, to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. So Jesus came to earth and redeemed us to be kings. Today, the Holy Spirit can empower us to reign for those who are in Christ Jesus. I love the way the message points to this reality in Romans chapter 5, verse 17. It's in the form of a question, but I think you can grasp it. If death got the upper hand through one man's wrongdoing, can you grasp the breathtaking recovery life makes, sovereign life, in those who grasp with both hands this wildly extravagant life gift? This grand setting everything right that the one man, Jesus Christ, provides. Thomas Schreiner said, The the risen Christ is exalted as the messianic king because of his suffering and death. Even though everything in the created world is not yet subject to his reign, human beings will rule over the world only if they belong to Jesus. And they will share future reign with him. I'd be lying to you if I said I didn't struggle finding application for us to go home with this morning. I sat in my office and I prayed through it. God, how do we, how do we bring this home this morning? I want to share a couple of thoughts with you that are found right here in the text that I believe we can apply. It's just based on what David did. It's doing the same thing David did. The first idea I'd charge you to, to practice is this idea of Make your praise personal. Personalize your praise. David started this psalm of praise with the phrase, O Lord, followed by our Lord. It was a personal cry. It was a personal shout of adoration unto God. One commentator said this this psalm is both passionate and intimate. The God who fills the earth with his glory He's our God. He's my God. Psalm 145, 18 says, The Lord is near to all who call on him. I've learned this on a personal level. We don't serve a distant God. He's not disengaged, uninterested, uninvolved in our lives. He's close. He's personal. He wants to have an intimate relationship with us, a relationship where we can be real with him, where he speaks and we listen, we speak and he listens. The God whose name is majestic is also close to us. Jesus said it this way, no longer do I call you servants for the servant does not know what his master is doing. I have called you friends. 
for all that I have heard from my Father have made known to you. And so considering that reality, personalize your praise. You have a God who's close, who wants to have an intimate relationship with you. Second idea here is to consider God's condescendence. I guess what I'm trying to say here is that the God of the universe stoops low to care for us. Jesus himself assured us that the very heads on our heads, some less than others, the very hairs on our heads are counted for. Someone once said it this way. Of humanity, he said, he was made of the dust of the ground, a very unlikely thing to make man of. But the same infinite power that made the world of nothing made man its masterpiece of next to nothing. He was not made of gold dust, powder of pearl, diamond dust, but common dust, dust of the ground. Our fabric is earthly, and the fashioning of it like that of an earthen vessel. What we then to be proud of? The worship team would join me. We're almost done, but as we consider his condescendence, we should remember, we should reflect on the reality that we are small, but he cares for us. He's mindful of us. The way I see it, blessed are the, the meek, right? The, the, the more we remember our littleness in the light of God's majestic name, the greater and more glorious are benefits of God in Christ. In short, recognition of our smallness leads to greater glory. And so we consider God's condescendence. We personalize our praise. And lastly, we rejoice in our redemption. We are made great in Jesus through his redemption. Caveat is is for those who are in Christ. And so my charge to you this morning, if you haven't received Christ as Lord, is to consider that this morning. For those of us who are in Christ, is to keep our eyes fixed on him. Because we have no joy but in Christ. It's to grab hold of a full life that's found in Jesus. Listen, the truth is we live as slaves more often than not because we don't live in the reality that we've been redeemed. Too often we think of the story of Scripture as starting in Genesis 3 at the fall and ending in the lake of fire. But the truth of Scripture is that it goes from creation, yes, the fall, but then to redemption and ultimately renewal. And there's hope in that reality, is there not this morning? You are Christ's and He is yours. As Adam stood for his descendants, so does Jesus stand for all who are in Him. You have been redeemed, those of you who are in Christ. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, God's people brought into God's wonderful light from the darkness through Christ. Billy Graham once said this, and with this we'll close. I found in my travels that those who keep heaven in view like David looked at the stars remain serene and cheerful even in the darkest day. Forward-looking Christians remain optimistic, hopeful, and joyful, knowing that Christ someday will rule, and us with Him. Do you believe that this morning? We're going to close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we reflect on your goodness, on your name, synonymous with your nature, your character. You're faithful. You're a good God who loves us immeasurably. We hold on to that reality this morning. And like David, we reflect. But as we reflect, God, we remember to personalize our praise. You are our God. Lord, we consider the reality that you came down. We look at that reality with humility and the knowledge that a big God, the big God you are, you care for us, you're mindful of us, you move towards us, Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness there. And Father, today, we commit to rejoicing in our redemption. We hold on to that this morning. 
The fact that we were bought with the price. The fact that we are kings. We can live as kings now through the power of your Holy Spirit. So Lord, would you call these things to mind? It's in Jesus' name we pray.